On March the 11th, 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake struck below the ocean off the coast of eastern Japan, triggering tsunami waves traveling at speeds of 800 kilometers per hour and reaching heights of over 10 meters, devastating coastal areas. The disaster claimed the lives of more than 20,000 people. The tsunami also struck the Fukushima nuclear power plant, leading to the meltdown of a reactor core and resulting in massive radiation leakage. The damage resulted in the permanent closure of the nuclear power plant, necessitating its decommissioning, a difficult and complex task which is fraught with a multitude of challenges and obstacles. On a two-lane road, our bus occasionally encounters large trucks. Both sides of the road are adorned with lush green rice fields, creating a calm and peaceful atmosphere. The tranquility here is, however, in stark contrast to other rural areas of Japan. There is a pall of sadness, apprehension, and concealed anxiety over this place. As our vehicle approaches huge white towers, we have to stop recording in compliance with the property owner's regulations. So what are we doing here? ID. ID. This is inside the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. We can resume recording once we obtain a printed slip that records our personal and biometric information. Before entering and exiting the power plant, we must undergo a radioactive level measurement for comparison and for our safety. Because usually human body has radioactive already, but they have to make sure that after I coming out, it's not more than what I supposed to have. Kenji Abe, a manager at Tokyo Electric Power Company or TEPCO, the operator of the Fukushima nuclear plant, explains that humans are regularly exposed to radioactivity through foods such as bananas and seaweed, which contain potassium, a radioactive isotope. When consumed, our bodies can eliminate radionuclides through sweat or excretion, effectively removing them from our bodies. We need to wear socks, thick cloth gloves, a vest, and carry a portable radiation dosimeter before entering. For years, certain employees have been dressing like this inside the nuclear power plants. We've been informed that full radiation protection suits are no longer required in some areas, as the radiation levels have continued to decrease after the removal of debris and the installation of steel sheets to prevent the spread of radioactive dust. Abe explains that employees must pick up their protective masks here. There are various types available, including gas masks, which can be uncomfortable due to their restricted vision and ability to hear. Employees will select protective masks suitable for the specific conditions in the area in which they'll be working. We follow the officials onto a small bus, which meanders through several operational buildings before parking on a high hill where the ground is covered with sturdy concrete. About a hundred meters ahead, we see the location of one of humanity's most severe nuclear catastrophes. Four square buildings housed nuclear reactors that once supplied electricity to the Japanese people in the Kanto region, including the capital Tokyo. The 2011 earthquake triggered a merciless tsunami, which destroyed homes and resulted in tens of thousands of people going missing or dying. All four reactor buildings at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant were struck by waves. The electricity was cut off, causing the system that cools nuclear fuel rods to fail. When the cooling failed, the temperature inside the reactor rose rapidly. 
The intense heat led to the melting of fuel rods in reactors 1, 2, and 3, otherwise known as a meltdown. Abe, the TEPCO manager, explains that on the left is reactor building 1, where the hydrogen explosion occurred. There's still a significant amount of concrete debris on top of the building, and as we can see, they've been using the red and white crane to remove this contaminated rubble. They constructed a laboratory outside Reactor Building 2 to control the robots and dispatched officials to inspect and clean the interior. In Building 3, the removal of fuel rods through the dome roof commenced in April 2019. A specialized machine was employed for this task. In Building 4, at the far rear, all 1,500 fuel rods have been successfully removed only the building remains. The immense heat also triggered hydrogen explosions in buildings 1, 3 and 4. Today, traces of the damage from the explosions are still visible to the naked eye. The most perilous and invisible threat, though, lies within the buildings. Molten nuclear fuel rods. Meltdowns and hydrogen explosions led to the release of radioactive materials contaminating the surrounding environment. Hundreds of thousands of people had to be evacuated immediately. To this day, many cannot return, leaving the buildings, houses and streets vacant and deserted. The power station is now permanently closed. The mission of thousands of workers is no longer to produce life-supporting energy, but rather the decommissioning of the deadly nuclear power plant. One of the primary decommissioning tasks is to clean up the remnants of molten fuel rods and remove all intact fuel from the reactor buildings. This is a challenging mission due to the exceedingly high levels of radioactivity in the reactor buildings, capable of causing immediate death to anyone who enters without the right protection. Abe mentions that each building presents unique difficulties and challenges, making it hard to determine which one is more challenging. Reactor Building 1 sustained the most damage from the explosion, though, requiring significant time for debris cleanup. Building 2 appears normal from the outside at present, but the interior remains cluttered. Cleanup efforts here will also take quite some time. Building 3 contains the highest quantity of nuclear fuel rods, all of which must be completely removed. Due to the extreme dangers, the work must be carried out using robots. Many times, however, even robots sent into the reactor lose their mobility due to the high levels of radioactivity. Consequently, initial work was delayed. For example, in 2017, six years after the disaster, nuclear fuel rods were finally discovered in Reactor Building 3. This occurred when a robot named Mini Manbo, or Little Sunfish, captured images of the molten fuel beneath the reactor. The removal of the fuel rods in Building 3 commenced in 2019, and it took at least two more years to safely extract more than 500 rods. The decommissioning of this nuclear power plant is expected to take approximately 50 years. The initial steps involve removing debris and fuel rods from the reactors, but even this is not the most challenging phase. It's a complex and difficult undertaking. The world has never encountered a disaster of this magnitude, and there's no instruction manual or precedent to guide the process. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. Understandably, however, what concerns everyone the most following the disaster is the spread of radioactive substances such as iodine-131, cesium-137, strontium-90 and plutonium-239. 
Many of these are carcinogenic. Another part of decommissioning damaged nuclear power plants is the removal of contaminated soil. Due to the extensive area over which radioactivity spread, this takes a significant amount of time. During our visit in 2017, we saw workers clad in radiation protection suits scooping up topsoil into large black plastic bags. Returning to the area today, the scene is the same. The level of danger posed by radioactive substances varies depending on their properties, quantities, their half-life and environmental factors. The Fukushima incident may have been less severe than Chernobyl. The Institute for Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety, or IRSN, stated that at Fukushima, there was only one-tenth of the radioactivity released in the Chernobyl power plant accident. Inside the plant, even within a few meters of the reactor itself, the radiation dosimeter we carry shows non-dangerous levels. The people living in this area are not, however, feeling very trustful. At the Seirinji Temple in the Fukushima region, in addition to conducting religious ceremonies, another mission of the monks is to monitor the amount of radioactivity in the air using real-time detectors. All data is sent to a website operated by SafeCast, the world's largest organization for collecting data on radioactivity. Like many citizens here, Sadamaru Okano, a Zen monk at the Seirinji Temple, is skeptical about the information he receives from the authorities. So we do have our own radiation counts. So uh, if you access the website, you can choose it's safe or not. It's your choice. It's not our choice. It's your choice. So I let them know we do have devices. So choose yourself. Radiation detectors called Geiger counters have a detection range of up to 20 kilometers. They've become one of the tools on which many people here rely to prevent or reduce risk of exposure. In addition to temples, we see this kind of measurement being done at schools as well. A group of students are working diligently to create a simple radiation detector with the help of a former SafeCast volunteer. Norio Watanabe, a high school teacher and SafeCast volunteer, was directly impacted by the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. His entire family had to relocate, leaving him to care for his sick mother. In 2015, he was diagnosed with cancer, which he believes was caused or exacerbated by exposure to radioactive substances. Today, he dedicates his time to teaching children how to create their own tools for monitoring radioactivity levels. Watanabe explains that if he doesn't monitor the levels of radioactivity, this issue would eventually be forgotten and relegated to the past. Without regular measurements, there would be no evidence should anything occur in the next 10 years. Therefore, he aims to preserve this data for future generations. These people choose to rely on themselves because they believe that official information doesn't accurately reflect reality. The official radioactivity figures stating that it is safe may be because the measurements were not conducted across a wide enough range of locations, especially in places directly associated with people, such as schools, temples and workplaces. The car takes us down the hill towards the reactor site. Traces of the post-tsunami flood levels remain visible. Here, everyone must wear a mask, safety helmet and eye protection to use the walkway between nuclear reactor buildings 2 and 3. Traces of the hydrogen explosions and the tsunami's sheer power, such as the scratches, cracks and rubble, are clear to see. Aside from a few weeds squeezing through the steel plate joints, there was no other life in this area. While the Fukushima Daiichi disaster was less severe than Chernobyl, 
Based on the information from the International Nuclear Event Scale, the issue here is more complex due to the impacts on all the reactors. Less radiation leaked from this plant, but this indicates that there is still a significant amount of fuel left inside the damaged reactors. The soil and groundwater beneath the building are also heavily contaminated. This contamination was exacerbated by the continuous injection of water into the reactors in attempts to reduce the extreme temperatures following the failure of the cooling system. The amount of radiated water that has accumulated at Fukushima Daiichi since the accident in 2011 is enormous. All of it is stored in the thousands of gigantic tanks in front of us. Even though this water has been treated, it contains another radioactive substance which cannot be removed by any known means, tritium. Tritium is an isotope of the hydrogen atom. One property it shares with hydrogen is that it can combine with oxygen to form water. When tritium is mixed with water, it forms radioactive water, called tritiated water, which has the same chemical properties as ordinary water. This is why there are no available tools to remove tritium from water. Although it cannot penetrate the skin, tritium poses various risks, including cancer. Therefore, all tritiated water has to be stored in these tanks. The problem is that storage space is running out. Approximately 1.3 million tons of tritium-contaminated water is stored in the tanks, nearly filling the entire storage area. There's no precedent for guidance, as the world has never seen anything like this before. With no way to dispose of the remaining contaminated water, the government's previous approach was to reduce the amount needing external storage by using an ice wall. Located 30 meters underground and 1.5 kilometers long, this ice wall surrounds the reactor buildings, frozen at minus 30 degrees Celsius. It prevents contaminated water from leaking outside or seeping from beneath the reactors. The scorching sunlight produces water droplets on the metal nutheads, which had ice on them. Nonetheless, the ice wall diligently performs its duty. Such methods can, however, only delay the inevitable. If this water is not ultimately drained from the plant, the water storage areas will be full by the end of this year, 2024. In 2021, this prompted the Japanese government to officially announce a plan to release millions of tons of treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. The method involves treating this contaminated water with a high-tech filtration system known as Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS, to remove most of the radioactive isotopes before releasing it into the sea. Even though, as we know, tritium cannot be totally eliminated, the treated water will be diluted with seawater to reduce the concentration of tritium to below the limit set by the World Health Organization for Drinking Water, which is no more than 10,000 becquerels per litre. The release of millions of tons of treated but still radioactive water from Fukushima into the Pacific is expected to span 30 years. The first release occurred on August the 24th, 2023, with a continuous release of water for 17 days totaling 7,800 tons. TEPCO states that even if tritium remains, it will have, quote, a negligible effect on the human body, end quote. Both the Japanese government and the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, the United Nations nuclear watchdog, have confirmed the safety of water released from the power plant. The plan has predictably faced opposition from neighboring countries like China and South Korea, environmental activists, 
and the Japanese people themselves, especially fishermen and those in the seafood business. They urged Japan to abandon the plan due to concerns over its potential impact on the marine ecosystem and public health. The 2011 earthquake and tsunami that hit the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has posed one of humanity's most devastating and formidable challenges. The decommissioning of the nuclear reactors within the plant's confines has and continues to face numerous obstacles. Outside the plant, the waves of the Pacific Ocean seem tranquil today, but it cannot be foretold when they might become tumultuous once more. Stretching along the coastline, a 14-metre-high breakwater completely blocks the view of the sea. While the presence of large concrete structures may disrupt coastal ecosystems, the wall is deemed necessary as the decommissioning process of the plant continues. In the end, Japan's government has opted to release the treated but radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. There remains, however, uncertainty over whether the decision is indeed the right one. Meanwhile, the extent and scope of the impacts of these releases of contaminated water remain unknown. As we leave the power plant, we no longer need the helmets, goggles and face masks. Upon passing through the machine that measures radiation levels in our bodies once again, the in and out readings indicate no reason for concern. We are, however, merely short-term visitors, whereas thousands are dedicated to cleaning up the debris and remnants of a technology crippled by nature. They will continue to face numerous challenges and problems, which will undoubtedly weigh heavily on many minds.